Alrighty. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're just going to take a few seconds, let everyone come get in. So go grab your beverage of choice, a cozy blanket, get comfortable. We're just going to ramble a little bit <laughs> while this room fills up. And then we're going to get started. So, no, it's still going. It's still going. <laughs> I told you the 10, 10 awkward first seconds, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's totally like a game show. Watch it is. Numbers change. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to go for it. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to our little virtual event space. Um, my name is Allie. I'm the host for the evening. I will be doing my best to make sure that the gears turn well as the, the night passes. <laughs> and I am so, so excited to be introducing Robert Kolker and Susanna Kahalen here to discuss mental health and uh, Hidden Valley Road. So before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to very quickly thank you guys so, so much for tuning in um, and for, of course, buying books. Uh, your guys' support really is what keeps us going and we love what we do. So if you also love what we do, go ahead and head, oh, first of all, come on in, stores open, we'd love to see you, but if you are not local or don't wanna leave the house, which I understand entirely, um, we do ship, shipping is only $3.50 for the first book, and then a dollar for every book after that, and you get to support USPS too, so it's like a little added bonus. I will be linking to uh, books in the chat as the night goes on, so it'll be really easy to find them, and of course, while you are over, on our website, I definitely recommend signing up for our newsletter. It's just a once a week email. We're not going to spam you. And it just sort of tells you, you know, the fun community things that are going on in the bookstore. Um, people who are authors who are coming through, you know, book clubs that we're doing, because I think we have virtual book clubs online again, which is really fun and really exciting. And we would love to see people turning up for those, um, you know events, fun community things, and uh, with kind of a fun twist sometimes, blog posts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if that is not for you, definitely check out our social media. Uh, we are at Third Place Books on all of the major uh, social media platforms. Uh, we even have a TikTok, and we have a good time over there. We do fun and silly and, you know, informative stuff. So definitely go and see if there's anything there that you want to push the follow button for. Um, and I think, so let's see, we are here for about an hour. Uh, towards the end, we will be taking questions. Um, although it would be great if we could intersperse the questions as the conversation passes. So if there's something that you think of immediately, throw that in the Q&A and uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that stuff. So definitely throw your questions into the Q&A box. There are two available boxes to type in, the Q&A and the chat. The chat, we would love to see you guys connecting, sharing your thoughts and feelings, emoting, etc., in the chat button box. But once it's time to ask a question, we would love it if it was in the Q&A so we can actually find it when the time comes to ask. <laughs> and I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, Robert Kolker is a journalist and author whose work has appeared all over the place from the New York Times Magazine to GQ to Wired. He is a National Magazine Award finalist and a recipient of the 2011 Harry Frank Guggenheim Award for Excellence in Criminal Justice Reporting from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. His book Lost Girls was a New York Times bestseller and made a huge splash when it came out in 2013. And now Hidden Valley Road is only getting bigger. Uh, this is the, the story of a mid-century American family with 12 children six of whom were diagnosed with schizophrenia is a number one New York Times bestseller and Oprah's book club pick and has been named a best book of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, Time, Slate, Smithsonian, I could go on. Um, and then Susanna Kahalen is an award-winning number one New York Times bestselling author, public speaker, and journalist 
whose work has appeared in New York Times, the New York Post, Elle, the New Scientist, and BBC's Focus, as well as academic journals, The Lancet, and Biological Psychiatry. Uh, her incredible mem uh, 2012 memoir, Brain on Fire, has sold over a million copies and was made into a Netflix original movie. Her second book, The Great Pretender, investigates the legendary 1973 science paper on being sane in insane places and made an array of best of lists and was shortlisted for the 2020 Royal Society's Science Book Award. So thank you both so, so much for being here. I am so excited to be silently listening to this conversation. <laughs> um, if you need anything, my name is Allie. Give me a shout. I will do, you know, whatever I can. <laughs> um, and as to the rest of you, same thing. I will be trolling the chat for issues let me know if anything comes up and i'm gonna leave you all in their hands mm -hmm. so thank you guys both so much one more time and off to you <laughs> oh, great well thank you ali thank you to third place books um i have to say before we dive in i um i have to t tell a little bit of my story of when i first read bob Kolker's book which was when it was in galley form um, and I was in, of all places, this is pre-pandemic, I was in a hot tub near the Gowanus, um, they, which is a very strange combination of things, um, a super fun site in Brooklyn. And um, I was reading his book and I was sobbing into this hot tub. And um, I was just kind of in awe of what I was reading. I, I couldn't figure out how he did it. And uh, it's such an honor to be here um, in, under very different circumstances, but um, it's just wonderful to be here and, and get to talk to you about a book that is is undeniably a masterpiece. So, um, so thank you for for uh, you know asking me to be in conversation with you. Just it's just great to be oh, here. With thank you. you. I mean, that, that couldn't be nicer. Thanks so much, Susanna. I, it's an honor to be talking to you. And um, one of the nicest things about about publishing this book is it gave me an excuse to reach out to folks whose work I admired so much. And it was, it's been great to get to know you over the last, um, I guess, two years now, because you really looked at it early. And, um, and it's been great to talk with you in a lot of different contexts since then. And thank you again to Third Place Books and Allie and everyone here. And please um, throw questions in the chat anytime you want. Um, it's been a year of Zooms for me. Um, as the book has sort of made an impression in a way that I never could have predicted. And I'm really excited. I think the only one who isn't excited is my dog, who I see is in the frame here. He seems a <laughs> little bored. But he is so over this. <laughs> he's done. He's done. Um, but uh, I have to say um, that what makes every Zoom different for me is the chance to talk to different people. And so I'm excited to talk with you, Susanna, about, about all of this. I'm hoping that, you know, I think you've gone granular. We talked about this prior to going on here, you've gone granular into the book. And I think a lot of people who are participating in this maybe have know a little bit about the book or even read it in hardcover. So I want to talk and, and we can go in, in multiple directions because you know, at any point, please do um, put your questions in Q&A and I'll in interweave them. But I do want to talk about process and writing and research and the kind of grappling with the history because that's that was so impressive to me how you were able to do that. So so we've kind of got a big picture that kind of what is a writer's life? What is your process? Those kind of questions. So, so before we get to, to the book, to Hidden Valley Road, why we're here, I, I think I, I'd love to hear a little bit about your career, your, your, your really impressive career prior to Hidden Valley Road, prior to Lost Girls, your, your career in magazine, in the magazine world. And I, I'd love to hear a, about, about it and also kind of what, what stories do you think prepared you for something of this? kind of emotional, um, in-depth, um, just really psychologically astute level? Like what, what prepared you for that, do you think, most? Um, well, I, I, I guess one short answer to this is that I spent more than 15 years on staff at New York Magazine, which is a, an exciting place to be for a writer like me who, who does a lot of you know, heavily researched reporting that also is supposed to have a little bit of sizzle to it. So it's supposed to be supposed to be smart, but it's also supposed to be entertaining. And so I've tried to sort of train that way. But before then, you know, I always wanted to write, but I really didn't discover journalism until my twenties. Um, when in searching for work, I got a job at a little weekly newspaper in Manhattan. And I think the the issue for me is that the friends of mine who really wanted to be journalists, they really wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein, or they wanted to be foreign correspondents. 
Um, and I just didn't dial into that or connect with that emotionally. But at this little job where I was interviewing people in the neighborhood who were going through trials and tribulations and coming back to them every week, I, I really connected with reporting in a different way. And I started to want to write longer and I got into all the things that you would, you would imagine, you know, like, like the new journalism or you know, reading Tom Wolfe or Gay Talese or Joan Didion and wanting to do what they did. And then at that point, I just took whatever opportunities I could and was really a generalist. And what, what gave me confidence was that I felt after a time I could really parachute into a lot of different situations and write reasonably well, um, or at least coherently about things that I really hadn't known nothing about beforehand. And that meant tangled court cases that sometimes meant science and medicine, um, often meant crime uh, and criminal justice reporting, but always meant narrative and always meant writing about people going through things, people in crisis. So, so that was really my career. Although in the beginning, I really did anything people would throw at me. By the end of my time at New York Magazine, I had been typecast. I was not the person who was gonna interview the mayor or a movie star. I was the one who was gonna talk to a grieving family or was going to try to get a jailhouse interview with, um, you know, with, with, uh, with the high profile criminal and then talk to his neighbors. So it, it, was, it was that kind of career for the longest time. But the fun part for me was how it was a two track uh, high and low approach every single time. Um, I never knew going in whether the stories I wrote would be 80% uh, a tangled tale and what happened next and lots of suspense and 20% the important social issue that's bubbling beneath the surface that we all need to think about and that makes it more than just a yarn. Or perhaps it would turn out to be 2080 and it would be you know, a, a social issue story where the narrative only is used as a small example. And you know that I got used to really being comfortable not knowing exactly what the finished product would be like, whether it would be you know, how much would be one way or how much would be the other way. And I, and I liked it that way. I also got used to um, appreciating doing a story even after I'd said no to doing it about 30 times. And that's the case with, um, with my first book with Lost Girls that I had written for New York Magazine about the Long Island serial killer case. And I was really allergic to writing about that case. It just, it seemed like there'd be nothing for little old me to be able to find out about this case. I had no police sources out in Long Island you know, the, the, the people I thought would be impossible to get to know. But then before long, it actually became very much the sort of story that I always did, which is writing about ordinary people caught up in extraordinary situations. I got to know all of the families. I got to tell their stories. I got to write about the lives of the women who are all victims of the same killer. And I, I com compiled together their narratives into a book that really was very I thought very fulfilling and satisfying. It did something different and it, and it, it was exciting to do. That, all of that is sort of a prelude to, to when I met the Galvin family, which was at least five years after Lost Girls came out. A mutual friend of ours introduced me to the two sisters in the family. We're talking about 12 children in the family, 10 boys and two girls who are the youngest. Uh, they were in their 50s by then. And they, ha after many years of thinking about how best to let the world know about their story had decided that it, it really would take an independent journalist to get all into all of the different approaches and corners to talk to every family member to figure out why the science was interesting to write about some very very sensitive subjects to get get past the stigma and to to just to get that number of people straight on the page was going to be hard and so they wanted to find someone who they thought could do it and our mutual friend was my good friend, John Gluck, who edited me at New York Magazine for many years. So he thought I'd be a good match for the material, not because I knew anything about the science of schizophrenia, but because um, I knew how to write narrative about people in crisis and families in crisis. And so the book for me was a real mix of familiar and unfamiliar in that way. And the familiar part gave me confidence and the unfamiliar part, the science of schizophrenia, was actually rather exciting because it was a chance once again to parachute into something unfamiliar and learn something new. All of it was very intimidating. It seemed like a very unusual book. Most mental illness books are memoirs yeah. and, and uh, they're all wonderful, but this seemed a little different in that way. And, um, and I wanted it to be a family story first and foremost, um, even though I also wanted to do right by the, the scientific part about schizophrenia. 
And I do think this is where your work and my work, Susanna, have some overlap because you didn't you didn't wake up one day saying, I want to write about these issues. They were thrust upon you, you know, in your personal story. And and then then from there, you you didn't just write about your personal story. You went to work as a reporter and really studied for Brain on Fire. Um, everything that happened to you and then everything that possibly could be happening to others who had your your condition. And if you guys haven't read Brain on Fire, you should read Brain on Fire. And The Great <laughs> Pretender, which again is is both personal and heavily researched and uh, you know uh, eye-opening journalism about you know something frankly scandalous and shocking in the world of science. So that I think that it, there's a place there's a place for um, I don't know, Siddhartha Mukherjee to write the gene, but then there's also a place for, for lay people, for journalists to go in and try and find a compelling story about something that uh, otherwise people might find impenetrable. Do you think, yeah, and to that point, do you think that as a lay person, um, there are some, can you, can you kind of describe some of the benefits to being lay generalist reporter, journalist, writer, than someone who maybe is more siloed and hyper-specialized. Like what, in my experience, it's been that I ask the stupid questions and I'm not embarrassed about it, <laughs> you know? I, and then I realize that the stupid questions don't have answers, which is sometimes scary. But uh, did, did you have similar experiences with, with, this, with this topic? Certainly, yeah. Sometimes the stupid questions would be stupid questions, but yes. other times I would ask the question and go, that's a stupid question, right? And they would say, no, 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 that's, that's the thing none of us know the answer that's to. That's the question, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and you, know, you, should, you should pay attention to that question because it's gonna keep coming back to you. For instance, this particular book's about schizophrenia. No one's quite sure what it is or right. where it comes from. What is from. schizophrenia? That question yeah. in and of itself will have people scratching their heads a bit. And you get many answers from many different people. Absolutely. So that, in a way that's scary because what if I'm wrong? What if, I do, what if I pick a lane and then suddenly the book is really off base in some way and it becomes embattled. But then you just, um, you try to cover the waterfront and check around and make sure that you're 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 giving a, a fair shake to every to every theory. But to me, that's the bu that's the feature, not the bug, right? The, the competing okay. theories, the arguments um, between different schools of thought. That that's the fun part. That's the part that makes it a real story and that helps people understand that there are real human beings doing the research here. And as I say this, I realize I'm playing your song, Susanna, because the Great Pretender is is all about that. These are mm -hmm. about fallible human beings who, uh, starting starting with Rosenham, who, who really made history with a study that then you, you, you research and find out so much more about than anyone ever really uh, thought they knew. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I think, and I'm gonna get to this, but I wanna get into, but I think we both probably fell in love a little bit, with, fell in love and, and, and somewhat discussed too with the history of, of the modern history of psychiatry, um, which is it, its own minefield. Um, you know, but in terms of, you know, you had said you, before that, you know, with Lost Girls, you felt this kind of allergic reaction to wanting to jump into that and then eventually kind of did. Did you have any hesitations about taking something that was so fraught um, with uh, so much trauma attached to a family? I mean, um, you know, did you have any, any fears about taking on this project? From the very start, they, the sisters were not shy about everything that happened in the family. They were ready to talk about it all. And for those not familiar with the book, that includes not just six out of the 12 children having severe mental illness. It also means a murder-suicide. It also means sexual abuse. It means clergy abuse. Uh, there's um, one child who, for her own safety, is pulled out and raised somewhere else for a few years, which causes its own emotional damage. And and it just it, it just gets sadder and sadder. So my initial shock was, how could this still be a family? How, what, why are they still together? Why didn't these sisters leave and never come back? Why do they want their story to be told? How did they move through this trauma? And so I was both allergic and, and also fascinated by that. But I had a lot of fears. The first is that the book would be like a car crash where everybody would just want to rubberneck and I didn't want to be a part of that because these people had been through enough. Um, the second was that it would be like a monster movie, that it would be like, you know, and then brother number two uh, became a victim of the illness and like, like the invasion of the body snatchers. And I wanted to write about them as human beings. I didn't want, I wanted to represent mental illness as, a, as something that happens to people, not as some mystical, strange other thing that, that happened out the, like a lightning bolt out of the sky. I wasn't interested in the poetry 
of, of the family's dilemma. Right. I was interested in the family's dilemma. And so I wasn't sure if I'd be able to do that justice at first. Um, and frankly, I was worried about the technical challenge of writing about a family with 12 children. That's 14 people to keep yeah. straight. And ha what would happen if um, in the middle of the book, the, the reader just picks up the book and throws it across the room and says, I can't keep these kids straight. And what's the point? Um, how, how would that work? But then the flip side of that is it becomes epic in scope. This is a family with 12 children born exactly during the baby boom born from 1945 to 1965, and they come up at, during a time of great optimism, and they implode at the same time that the country is on fire a little bit from the late 60s and early 70s. So it, it just feels like this epic family saga from the beginning. And so I, I wanted to rise to that occasion and try and do something with that. I remember I said to, I would say to friends, is this a science book, like a case study book about researchers who find an interesting family? Is it about two sisters who survive a difficult childhood? It, what's it about? And the answer was always the same. They, uh, people said to me, do it all, do it all, make this a big book. And so I, I eventually got comfortable with that and, and got to work. No, I mean, it, it has the feel of a Gothic novel uh, in, 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 in some ways. Um, we actually do have someone from the Galvin family here. So- um, Oh, really? That's great. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, let's take a look. We have Lindsay Mary. Oh, oh yes. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, Lin Lindsay, yes. Hi. So, uh, <laughs> Mary hi, Lindsay. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um, uh, Lindsay ran, ran her own book group, book club group about, discussion group about the book um, uh, with the Aspen Words Festival just recently. <laughs> and which was actually, I mean, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but it, um, uh, it but funny. it, but it, um, but Lindsay really, um, it was like a homecoming in a way because the family spent a lot of time in Aspen. This is a Colorado family. And the father, the patriarch of the family had actually lectured at the Aspen Institute. So for her to be talking in this context, she said was very special uh, for sure. So, I mean, I, I don't wanna speak for Lindsay, but um, it seems like you've had the support of the family in the it kind of the, there's been a, a positive reaction to the book. Um, can you speak a little bit about the kind of reaction within the family? <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, Lindsay's like, go ahead, say it all. Well, I mean, all right, I, I, fine. Now I'm yeah. gonna say the truth. Now, now, that, that both sisters, Margaret and, and Lindsay, were determined to tell all. There was never a time where I would ask a question and they'd say, "Well, really, I don't want to talk about that. That's private." I mean, they had done all their thinking about those issues before I came along, so they were ready to roll. And Lindsay was a, of a particular help because they did not have every single medical file and all of the brothers, and so it was really a uh, she was the chief caregiver for the surviving mentally ill brothers. So she really did the, did the heavy lifting to try to get um, medical files that nobody had ever seen before. And those files really made a huge difference in, in the book as well. Um, but I was definitely concerned that there would be at least one Galvin family member who would say a book, are you kidding me? And then we, there were medical privacy laws to consider. Yeah, everybody would have to give consent to talk about this. I was really quite concerned in the beginning. And mm -hmm. so I took my time and talked to every family member at least once just to hear them out, to hear what they were saying. And what I realized is that um, the really tough stuff that had happened to this family had happened decades ago. So people were more willing to talk about it. And also um, a lot of the terrible things had really been visited upon the sisters because they were the youngest and stayed in the house, uh, stayed around the longest. And so the older members of the family once they heard that the sisters wanted this story told, they deferred to them. Um, Lindsay, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that was my perception that a lot of them, Michael, for instance, would say, well, if the girls want to do this, okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that happened. And then finally, Mimi, the mother of the family who was still alive uh, for much of my reporting, she was ready to talk to, and that was not always the case with her. I think she would, she would have much rather not talk about the family troubles for many years, but there was some good scientific news that had happened just as I was coming on the scene. And she found that that was rather vindicating. She felt like it was really mm -hmm. um, good news for her because it proved that this illness was genetic. It wasn't anything she did as a mother. And, and so she, she calmed, you know, she was taking it all a little easier too. Uh, Lindsay's adding her brothers who also, who suffer um, also felt that was important. And so that, that was a problem. Yes, helpful yes, well. indeed. And so, that was very early on. I, I visited and Lindsay drove me to the three different places where, where her three surviving mentally ill brothers were. 
And very, very quickly, I realized, well, I don't have to worry about, you know, the, I thought it would be a challenge to write about them as human beings, but of course they're human beings. And right. of course they have different personalities and they all, they all were, they all were motivated to talk and to tell, you know, to talk about their lives. Yeah, and you know, I have so many kind of questions that are emerging, but you, you pick, I'm gonna pick that thread of Mimi. Um, and you know, there is this kind of lo long trope in the history of psychiatry with the schizophrenogenic mother and usually, you know, blaming the mother. And, and you know, I think Mimi in some ways has been, um, I don't know if readers have found her controversial or, or you know, she's a complex character. Um, how did you, um, how, what have been the responses to Mimi? And what, um, when you were writing her character, I mean, how do you view her kind of from, you know, a kind of kind of across her life? I mean, there's a lot of different versions of her, but, um, you know, how do you view Mimi and have the readers reacted to Mimi? It's my favorite question to ask readers, actually, what they think of Mimi, because the answers are all over the place. Um, and really the answers from the kids were all over the place. Everybody had a slightly different take on her. The sisters in the very beginning in those first conversations, they would say, oh, our mother was in denial for a long time. And they, she really chose the sick brothers over us and put us in harm's way. But then by the 15th interview with, with each sister, the conversations were much more subtle and, a bit, and much, more, uh, much broader about the challenges that Mimi faced and, and the time that she was living in and the options she did not have. And the fact that she was basically marooned because her husband, while at the time everyone worshiped him, he actually was a little degree removed from the situation and not really taking charge and handling it the way that she was. And so she becomes very complex. You could fault her for this and that, and mm -hmm. it's easy to do that, but it, it, I did not want to turn her into a cardboard villain. I, I think that fiction and nonfiction tend to do that a lot. They turn mom into this monster oh, and I just well, didn't want to do it. You and, know, that's the, right. yeah. and, I, and so I worked really hard to make sure that people understood her rationale. And then mm -hmm. of course she has, she keeps so many things secret for various reasons that, that she is the engine of many different revelations that happen in the book. Like suddenly, uh, you know, she breaks news for the family. Like the, 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 the daughters are in their 20s when they learn about something from their mother's past. And then they're in their 30s when they learn something about their father. And it just keeps going on and on and on all because Mimi was trying so desperately to manage the flow of information about, about so many things. I think Lindsay has come down with the, with the viewpoint that Mimi is a saint. And I think that's- <laughs> Yes, well, sure. you know, Absolutely. Lindsay has, is has taken over caregiving for for the three surviving brothers and so she, i've observed this that she she really identifies now with the best of mimi and sees everything that she had to handle that she had and literally had also double the work being the recipient you know recipient of blame you know on top of it all and and probably a lot of guilt that can't you know help the situation at all um we have an interesting question from q a which again i will remind everyone if you have any questions throw in the q a and i'll incorporate as um as it comes up but um this is i, I like this did you notice any of your own preconceived beliefs about mental illness um come up when you were writing and researching your books and if and if it did um is this common i think first of all I, i'm curious as to how to add to that like how does your view of people with schizophrenia, people with serious mental illness, how has it changed through the course of reporting this book out? And yeah, did, did your own preconceived beliefs kind of leak into any of your interactions when you, in, especially in the early stages? Um, I, in my twenties and thirties and even my forties, I think I was convinced that mental illness was a brain chemistry issue and that science was doing a pretty good job of finding the right pills to to try and have a serious impact on various brain chemistry problems that caused various mental illnesses. And that it, with a little hard work and trial and error and luck and therapy, you might be able to find a prescription that could help you. But while that I think is accurate for some, for anxiety or for depression or for bipolar disorder, I had no idea that for schizophrenia, they're basically using the same drugs that they, they prescribed back in the, in the 60s. Yeah. and that these drugs are symptom suppressors mostly, that they make the patients more manageable, but they don't necessarily cure anything. And they have their own health effects. The, the, the cure can sometimes be worse than the, than the disease, which is tragically what has happened to a number of the Galvin brothers and is, is in the middle of happening with Matthew now, as Lindsay is, and I have talked about. Um, it, the, the drugs just sort of wear you down and take their toll in, with a myriad of health effects. 
And this was all news to me. But the other part of your question is something I've thought about a lot too. I think um, I, I think when, you know, I, I've been in New York City since I was 18, you know, first for college and then I stuck around. And so you see a lot of, you know, homelessness, you see a lot of mentally ill people. And from a policy perspective, they you know, they're, sometimes they're called mentally ill chemical abusers. And so I would walk down the street and nine times out of 10, I would think, well, that's a policy problem that I'm looking at there. There's a, a person who, if the city or the state or the federal government had a different way of dealing with this, that person would have better care. But now, ever since I started work on this book, when I look at, at people who are disturbed on the street, I think there's a story there. There's a family there. There are people out there who love this person and people who they love and what happened there, what's going on. And it, yeah. it just- um, These people don't have a, have a Lindsay or a Mimi to, to take care of them. Exactly. And this is, this is one family story, it's a family that was not wealthy, but also was not on the street either. So it, it's kind of occupying this middle space, but we all know um, and Lindsay's active on this issue, actually, as an activist. We, we know that men mental illness and, and homelessness go hand in hand quite often. Now, um, I, I, will, I will use the opportunity to ask about updates with the Galvin brothers um, in light of COVID. And I know institutional settings have been really affected by COVID. Um, how are things going from, from what you know? Um, I've heard they've all been vaccinated now, which is good news. Oh. Lindsay can correct me if I'm, I think it's all of them. Um, they, they do not understand why they, they couldn't have contact with lots of people, why they couldn't have visitors. And that, that I guess would be analogous to people who have family members yeah. in, in nursing homes who have dementia and just can't, can't understand the distance. So that part's been very sad. Um, oh, Lindsay says uh, she just took Don, Donald, the oldest son in the family, her oldest brother to a cardiologist and um, and that cardiologist is 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 having an argument. It sounds like with with Lindsay oh. about whether or not um, huh. the medicines Don is taking are going to hurt him. And of course, I imagine Lindsay has a very different I'm sure <laughs> uh, uh, opinion about that. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so I I, I want to talk um, pivot a little bit and talk um, a bit about the history, uh, which you weave in so beautifully. I mean, this what's so striking about this book is that not only do you have this just incredibly power, powerful family narrative, but then you have these artfully woven in really, um, th really thought out. I mean, I, as someone who spent six years diving into the history of, 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 of psychiatry and deep diving too far, I was really stunned by like how you were able to be succinct, powerful, engaging, and really get the material. Cause oftentimes when people take it on, it's usually not fully maybe the full, it's hard to get any full story, but oftentimes things are so siloed, it's so hard to um, get a full picture of that history. Now, um, Edward Shorter, who wrote A History of Psychiatry called the history a minefield. Did you, um, did you encounter that? Um, did you, did you um, feel that it was as fraught as I did when I was doing my research? Definitely. I got on the phone with him. Did you? Uh, very early on. I thought, well, I might write a book about schizophrenia. Let's get on the phone with the historian about schizophrenia and ask him what he thinks. And he, he said something similar. He said um, that it's a disease of theories, Yeah. that, that it's all competing theories. Well, and that actually ended up being a guide to me. I, was look, I looked at the, 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 the battling schools of thought, that it was nature, that it was nurture, that it was about infection or that it was about genetics or that it was about bad mothering. Um, that Freud was right, that Freud was wrong. You know, uh, all of those, all the tunnel vision that that gives you, all the various um, arguments that happened over the years and how they basically are the same argument that's happening over and over again, but with different people. Absolutely. So that, that's what I locked in on to tell the story. It was, this, it was a story, it was conceptual history essentially. But, my, but I, I mean, one of the nice things about doing something like this is you have a lot of great models. There are a lot of amazing nonfiction writers who very, very seamlessly weave in very, very technical information that could otherwise bore you. Um, and they just do it without you even noticing. You know, like the, um, what's the book? The Sneaky Chef, like where you're like, you know, sneaking vegetables into the pancakes yeah, right. so your kids eat their vegetables. So that, that it's a little bit like that. And so I, Michael Lewis is great at it, but there are others as well where, where, where he tells you exactly what you need to know 
to raise the stakes for the story. And then just when you're about to get bored, he zips away and goes back to the story yes. itself. And that's what I wanted to do. And there was a lot of revision with that. And there was a period where I, where I said, well, I'm just, this is just vanity, all of this research. I'm going to pull it all out. And then I tried to read the book without, without the, the passages about all the, met, all the scientific history. And I found myself kind of unable to breathe, that, that it, it was all just this relentless story about this family and that without any context, without any ability to really frame it around what was going on in terms of what people actually thought about this illness. And so I realized it was kind of necessary. So yeah, I, um, I, take that I worked with it. I worked with it. Yeah, I think that would have been a huge mistake if you had taken that. I mean, I, I think that unfortunately, most people are not very aware of the modern history of medicine in general, but in of psychiatry specifically. And so I think you're going to be doing actually a great service with this book because people will have a broader understanding of that. Um, and, and so many people are touched by, you know, mental illness, uh, mental unwellness, whatever you want to call um, whatever specific malady someone's dealing with. Um, and so I think to know where they stand in that history is, is really important. Um, and, but did you find um, certain subjects particularly hard to, to tackle? Um, can you, can you in, in that history, did you, did you find anything? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of violence in the family and, and we know that from the statistics that people with acute mental illness are mm -hmm. 10 times as likely to be victims of violent crime as they are to be perpetrators and that, that the numbers just don't bear out and yet the media kind of focuses on the violent mentally ill people on the subway stabbers or whatever, the people who go on crime sprees. And, and that, it, that it kind of infects everything. It, it infects the way the police think about mentally ill people. They look at them as potentially dangerous when sometimes it makes sense to not engage with them that way. And I didn't want the book to be part of that. So I, I tried to very much to pay attention, not just to the bad things that happen in the violence, but what happens after that, what happens before that, what the motivations are, why it, how it, just to try and give as many ripple effects and as much context as possible so that again, it wasn't like a, um, a bad action movie or a bad monster movie. And then the other big one is um, Jim Galvin, the, the second son in the family. He's the main perpetrator of sexual abuse. And he also you know, had acute mental illness. And that, that was a real minefield because I didn't want to suggest at all that schizophrenia caused pedophilia. Nice. And, you know, there's no data to support that. And I didn't want to be out front with a book that would suggest it. So I actually come out explicitly in a couple of places in the book. And I say, you know, don't get the wrong idea here. Um, right. So that was a, that was tough. That's that is tough. a case of a part not illuminating a whole. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. Um, now, genetics of schizophrenia, um, which is such an interesting kind of development towards the end, like you said, there is this kind of new movement in this. Will you talk a little bit about that? A little bit of that history that were you know the twin studies that originated I think it kind of halfway through the century and then um, you have this kind of dearth of real um, knowledge about genetics that kind of have reemerged right um, recently. Mm -hmm. Do you tell us what 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 we've discovered and about um, uh, the genetics of schizophrenia? What the Galvin family have contributed to that, um, and what we st like we still don't know. Sure, I mean before 1900 anyone who was looking at mental illness could look at royal families who are sort of well known and could say could see how madness kind of runs in the family sometimes and so they could make the argument that it was genetic but the problem is that the closer they would look at it they would also see mental illness that would seem to pop up all by itself without a relative and also it very rarely seemed to go from parent to child so that left a lot of room for other explanations including bad mothers which when psychotherapy really was when it really started to rule the day in the middle of the 20th century in America, the, the schizophrenogenic mother became this term. You know, you've heard about refrigerator mothers with, with autism, this was similar, but for schizophrenia. And, um, and that, that had, from the start that was illogical, but it really took hold in therapeutic circles because the people studying genetics were never able to, lay, to really nail it down. They would do these twin studies but then the people who believed in bad mothering would say, well, sure, the twins have both have schizophrenia because they both were raised in the same house by the same mother. And then they would go and look at adoption studies to see, you know, well, you know, let's see how that works. And they, they did find some persuasive evidence, but even so, 
uh, that didn't seem to do the trick. And right up into the early 1980s, many, many, many clinicians have told me that they were ra- they were they were taught in medical school that you know that a bad attachment from mothers or poor parenting from mothers and fathers or bad family dynamics were all contributors to schizophrenia. And eventually, once technology caught up with them, it that that started to fall away. And that was good news for science, but. Um, it still didn't necessarily give decisive information about for families like the Galvins. And that, so the, the Galvins really presented a really interesting case study for people because they could look at a lot of schizophrenia in one family. And then hopefully when the genome was sequenced, they would really be able to look under the hood at the genetic makeup of this family and find, I'm going to mix a metaphor. They're going to go under the hood and they're going to find the smoking gun, you know, they're going to, they're, and, they're, right. and, right. and, fi- and, and figure out exactly what, what caused schizophrenia. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, that the the Human Genome Project wasn't helpful for schizophrenia, except that it proved decisively that genes, uh, that it's a genetic illness. And so that that debate has kind of calmed down. But it's shifted now because it's possible the genes are expressed by the environment, which means that trauma or poor childhood, a calamity of some sort, could actually activate a dormant gene that uh, gives you a vulnerability to schizophrenia. So the, to get to the Galvins, the excitement about the Galvins is that um, they've sequenced the family's genome and they found a couple of mutations, particularly one mutation, one variant that is directly related to brain function that seems to be this family's issue. And that's rather exciting, not because other families might have the specific variant because everybody has different variants that cause different things, but because it kind of shines a light uh, on a part of the brain that we should be paying attention to. And, and perhaps, gets us that much closer to helping other people as well. And, and so that part is particularly exciting. And then there's a whole other team of researchers that, that studied the family out of Denver, Dr. Robert Friedman. And he's found, he, he became, thanks to the Galvins and other families he studied, he became the first to identify a gene that was a player in schizophrenia. And now he has a strategy for making brains more resilient from the time even before you're born with a nutritional supplement for expectant mothers that he hopes will have an impact on anyone who has a genetic predisposition uh, for acute mental illness. It might help their brain become more resilient from the start. And that that's extraordinarily exciting. And to think that the Galvins played a role in that kind of, I mean, at the very least, it's a nice ending for the book, but it's a, it's a good feeling for the people in the family as well. Yeah, I, w- I wanna go straight into that, but I also have a really interesting question in, the chat box here. It's 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 long but worth reading through. Um, there's a point towards the end of the book that's that stuck out to me, and I can't stop thinking about where you mention a psychiatrist in 2010 who calls for the research community to redefine schizophrenia as a collection of disorders, the schizophrenia is essentially, um, rather than one disease. Thinking of schizophrenia as a symptom of a brain not working well rather than a disease itself, like how fever indicates the body is fighting something that fever is used a lot in this context, feels really revelatory and intriguing to me. Um, what was the most revelatory moment you had researching and writing this book? And she says, P.S. I obviously read and was blown away by your book, so thank you for sharing this family story. Thank you for that question, and thanks. I'm glad you. I'm glad you like the book. Yeah, that was an amazing thing to to hear. First, to hear the the head of NIH in 2010 when he stepped down, he said, "We got to stop calling it schizophrenia. We've got to divide it into 10 or 12 or six different disorders. We've got to look at them as discrete brain conditions and stop stop t- calling it this syndrome that that is one thing." And that really spoke to me because just hearing about these six brothers, you hear about how their symptoms are all different from one another. One had actual hallucinations, Joe. Um, Don, Donald has actual delusions where he just believes he's descended from an octopus. Um, you know, Peter's closer to the bipolar side of things. Um, uh, you know, some hear voices, it just gets, everybody's a little different. So how is this one illness again? And then to hear the analogy to fever is just amazing. You know, hundreds of years ago, fever was a disease. Now we know fever is a symptom of what could be a dozen different things. And I think that that's where we're going. I do think 40 years from now, the word schizophrenia might fall out of use and we'll know about maybe a dozen different discrete brain conditions, each of which we have, we're, we're along the way in different ways of being able to treat. I'm, I'm certainly hopeful about that. But the, the aha moment for me in terms of 
in terms of research? I think it was the notion that um, that that Mimi, the mother, was kind of a sitting duck. That that she was that she was a very very on it kind of mother, very active and very proud of her perfect parenting, and very disciplined and very determined. At a time when psychotherapists would look at that and say that that was a problem for her children and was causing their ch their children to become neurotic and schizophrenic. And, and uh, it just looked that, to me, that was like, that's like watching, it was like watching someone walk into an intersection as a bus is about to hit them. You're like, don't do it, don't, you know, and, and, and that, that, that was kind of a, a dreadful thing to, to contemplate that she is, she's thinking she's doing everything right. But then when something unexplainable happens, she ends up having the fingers pointed at her. Uh, that, that really got to me. Yeah, that's it. I, I have to say that, <clears throat> the way mothers have were treated within this is um it, it, i think it's so important that you've captured that with mimi because i think we will never really know that toll that not just the toll on um the mother the child with, who is suffering but also the the family around that that child who's dealing with the mother who's taking on an extreme burden of of blame and guilt um and i think that you unraveled that a bit for readers who might not know about that history and I, and I think it's really interesting to, um, to go back to that <clears throat> diagnostic um, question. Um, I, I, I personally am fascinated by that as well. And I'm glad you got to include this push now to, to orient schizophrenia around the symptoms, not around um, uh, uh, the concept of an underlying cause because we don't have it. So to, to imply that schizophrenia is a bona fide um, entity really is, 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 is not true. It's, it's, it's a set of symptoms that, um, for, that change drastically from one patient to the next. So one person with schizophrenia can look one way and another person can look completely different. So I really love that you were, that you, you, you tackled that a bit. Um, now, um, this also from before we were talking, um, you know, this idea of now we, I think um, Lindsay had said here that, uh, is it choline? Is that what it's, it's at? Is that uh, it's choline. choline. Choline in utero may help with, uh, with brain development and might make, make brains more resilient. Um, <clears throat> is there a sense that you have, um, Bob, that helping the progress in medicine, right? Um, uh, helping lead to some of these um, insights that might help others. Did that give the family, um, the Galvin's, Mimi specifically, and um, the greater family unit, did it give meaning and did it give purpose? And in some ways, I, I don't know if it's ever worth it, but uh, do you think that, that maybe it was because they might lead to some kind of amazing breakthrough for other people? Um, certainly toward the end of her life, Mimi pointed toward these breakthroughs or these signs of progress as, as something to be proud of. And, um, and it wasn't just because it, it said that certain things about her mothering style that, that, you know, it, it wasn't just because it helped her and, and her view of herself. She really did feel, I think, that, that being a part of progress made the family distinctive in some way. And I think a few of the others feel this way as well. Lindsay, you can see in the chat, is extremely enthusiastic about Colleen, and she should be. I mean, imagine if the brain receptor that was identified thanks to her family. Imagine if a doctor actually has found a way to, to help brains become so resilient that a problem with that receptor doesn't become something like schizophrenia later on. Um, that's just inspiring and, and would be wonderful. But then the question becomes, um, at, at what cost? I mean, the, the family went through so many difficulties. And I remember I I finished the manuscript of the first draft of the book and my wife read it. And one of the things she said to me, and she since has actually forgotten she said it, was this is a story about sacrifice. This is about a family that, and this is the way, this is a story about how science works, that in order to find out things that help other people, certain people are suffer uh, greatly, either because they're directly experimented on or because they their experiences are used for, you know, to, to study in some way. And, um, and that's what happened with the Galvins. And I can't help but think that there's a certain ambivalence there among some of the siblings, that some are very excited and very happy that something good is coming of it, and that's that. But then others sit and wonder, well, was it worth it? Like everything I went through as a kid 
and and there are other books that do this very well, like The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks does this well. You have this family that suffered so much after the mother and the family died, and then they learn that the mother's early death actually led to some of the most incredible scientific advances of our time. And what do they do with this information? I mean, they still don't have a mother. It's not like it's a happy ending. It's very, very strange. The dog thinks so too. No. <laughs> Um, so what has been um, the kind of overwhelming reader response to the book so far? Um, it, it's been, it's, you've had quite some time now since, been, it's been a year since it was published? Is it yeah, been? almost a year. Mm -hmm. Almost a year. Yeah. Were, were there some surprising, I mean, obviously there were surprising responses, but in terms of kind of trends of responses, were you surprised by some, some of the responses? What has been um, the feedback that you've gotten from the book? I put so much energy before the book came out in making sure I was telling an, a fair and accurate and sensitive story that was readable and making sure that I wasn't screwing up on the science and, and, and you know, saying something that was absolutely wrong and making sure that the story was coherent with so many people that I honestly did not think about the way it might connect emotionally with, with readers who have mental illness in their families. I'd never went to bed once at night thinking, what happens when somebody picks up this book who has an uncle or, or, or a sister-in-law with schizophrenia and reads about this family? What effect would it have on them? So that was, I just didn't have the bandwidth to look into it or to think about it. And so the big shock for me is all the emails I've been getting um, since the book came out, one after the other of people who from large families, from small families, quite often families that never really got help or were ashamed and hid the fact that they were getting help. Um, so the fact that it's connected emotionally with people in that way has just been very, very exciting and gratifying and really quite overwhelming. I imagine overwhelming as well, yeah. yeah. Um, that's interesting. I, I, whenever I talk to people about writing about mental health, it's everyone always has a story. Everyone is always, oh, well, my parents or my uncle or that you know it's it's everyone we're all I mean it's we all are connected by that I think um it's part of humanity really is is are these issues but you know I wanted to um ask you a kind of a bummer question um about COVID what's going on right now with COVID mental health care during COVID um we're seeing a lot of failure and we're seeing the kind of germ of a really kind of situational but very dramatic mental health crisis that is going, that is emerging, that is brewing. Um, after having done all the research you've done, do you feel optimistic that we will be able to handle that? Um, how are you feeling about the future in terms of mental health care in this country? Um, I think we all, most of us understand now that the human connection matters, that warehousing the mentally ill isn't, isn't working. And then that in fact, outcomes are better when people are cared for, particularly by people who they know. And so you see, um, you see the, a lot of sadness in this past year in a zillion different ways. There are the Galvin brothers who can't see their, their sister who, come, who used to come and see them all the time or other people used to see them. Now they don't understand why. There's, um, I spoke with the mother of, uh, of a mentally ill man in his 20s who could no longer had his job at the restaurant. And so his entire structure is gone. Like he can't go, you know, because of COVID the restaurant closed. So he's just completely um, decompensating left and right because he doesn't have that structure in his life. And then I was talking to a mental health services organization. I was like lining up a talk with them or something. And I, and, and suddenly they weren't, answering emails for a while. And finally they got back and said, we're just trying to get, we've been consumed with trying to get services to our clients. Like they're just, they were just impossible to get to because of this virus. And so we know it's important now. We know, we know what's needed. And hopefully that's something we won't forget going forward. Yeah, it's, it's disconcerting because as, as Lindsay says very accurately, our mental health system is horrific, which is I think the unanimous, the consensus of anyone who's had to really interface directly with it for long periods of time, it's, it's very much lacking. So you hope maybe COVID will throw all that in stark relief that we really need systems in place from acute to chronic, everything in between. Um, pivoting completely, um, I have to ask you, 
if this is one day a movie, <laughs> who plays the characters? Who would you like to see play? Let's say Mimi. Who would you like to see? Who would you well, like to see in in, in that? I'm not saying this because Lindsay's on the chat, but the whole family's so good looking. I know they really are very, very well cast. You know, it, there'll <laughs> it be a will lot not be of hard great... to cast because they are basically yeah. Hollywood good looks already. So yeah, a lot of good looking actors and, and actresses would do great with it. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, but I think that that I do think that it it would most likely be a mini series in my mind because there are too many characters and too much happening to try to jam it into a feature. Oh, and also people love mini series now. The limited series is kind of the thing now with the streaming wars going on. Absolutely. I think, um, and that way you see people over decades. So you have an actor who could play Mimi at age 30, 40, 50, and then 80 and 90, that would be exciting to see. And that would be, that would be a, a role, a plum role for somebody, I think. Apparently um, Mimi assuming, chose assuming the thing actually gets me. Yeah, Mimi chose Meryl, so we got to go with Meryl Street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. So we, I think we have some That's time. That's true, I, I choose George Clooney if, if Mimi's okay. going to be Meryl. <laughs> well, I, I think we have like only like a couple minutes. I'm sorry. Well, I, I hope that I could have in incorporated, but I think we had some shy audience members here, but we have a couple minutes, just a minute really. Um, before we have to end this. And I'd love to give the floor to anyone who maybe didn't, who wants to write in a question now. You have just a, a few more seconds to go before we're gonna, we're gonna call it a night. So I'll, I'll let them have a second, but um, you know, what's been, why I'm waiting for, if anyone wants to ask a question, I, I have to ask like, how have you been taking this success? Like, I, I mean, I know, you personally, and I know you're taking it very beautifully, but how it's, it's a really, it's a, it's, I mean, it's an amazing thing, but how, I mean, you, you couldn't have expected this kind of explosion. So how has your life changed? I mean, how do you, yeah, how are you dealing with this success um, of the book? Yeah, there are certain things like, like all the 10 best lists and then Barack Obama's list at the end of the year that really right. kind of knocked me out. And it, it was hard to look in the mirror for a couple of days because I was like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like that person. Mm. Uh, it, I guess you would, would therapists call that integrating the, I, had, oh, I, I needed time to like integrate the imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah, you, right. It's, yeah, it, right. Nothing, yeah, nothing activates a person's imposter syndrome like yeah. success. And getting on Barack Obama's reading list. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It just doesn't seem like me, but right. um and so I think January was about that, but then Feb also with everything happening in the country in January right. too. But then February, I kind of, I kind of, I'm appreciating that um, I have some freedom now and some liberty to look into new new things, and I'm not in a tremendous rush to uh, to 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 do anything out of panic, and that's a real privilege. So I'm really appreciating it no, sure. a, a yeah, lot I more mean, now. You it's, it's, you can take this moment and really, and you know, the, a lot of the kind of pat questions are, what are you working on now? I'm not even going to ask that because I don't want to hear that you're working on anything. I think you should take this time and really enjoy <laughs> the success of hard work and, you know, beautiful product. And, you know, I'm just thrilled to see Lindsay. Thank you so much for interacting with us and getting to hear some of your perspective was really great too. Um, thank you, so Lindsay. Thank you. This was a, it's a great night. So Thank you so much. I think I think again. I, I'm I'm going to ask again. Anyone? Oh, sorry. I have I have. Okay. Anyone? Oh, besides Lindsay. Oh, that's a anonymous <laughs> attendee. That's an unfair question. Besides Lindsay, who is your favorite <laughs> it's character? A loaded, when, it's a loaded question. That that is um, that's too hard. Um. <laughs> well, besides Lindsay. No, I know. I mean, I don't. I really don't look at it that way at all. No. I mean, everybody's I mean, really everybody's favorite. fascinating. Yeah. You, know, you try to I get mean, everybody's think, rationale. You could say favorite character or someone else's book, but um, <laughs> um, oh, this person Jane said um, she read the book and this interview makes me want to read it again. So there's, oh, here's Farah. Um, oh, thank you, thank you for reading uh, my book. I worked at an ICU. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, for, and to everyone involved for tonight's conversation, this has been really intriguing and interesting and enlightening. So this has been an. an intriguing and, and and on who is it my sister is my favorite character uh Lin Lindsay says that margaret's her favorite oh and i, I think I, that's I, very that's, that's very sweet um i really love getting to know them most of all i think i love getting to know the whole family but the two of them for sure it comes across in the book for sure 
I think. Oh, Allie, I think you're on mute if you're talking. Oh, oh, oh no, I was just quietly. I forgot that my, my camera emoting. was on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are at 8.01. So thank you guys so, so much for this conversation. This was so wonderful. And Lindsay, thank you for getting into the comments. This was such a great surprise. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I think we've we've sort of come to the end of our night. Um, everyone in the audience, come in, come buy books. Let us know uh, if you were here and what you thought. Um, and to the two of you, thank you so, so much for this conversation. This was so wonderful. I try not to uh, bombard authors in the green room, but I'm a huge fan of both of you. So thank you for being here. <laughs> so, and I think this is where we leave you. So I'm going to go eat some Indian food and, <laughs> and we will, uh, you know, see you soon. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you thanks so to much. everyone. Thanks, thanks to Third Place Books. And thank you, Allie. And Susanna, thanks for making this so special. And Lindsay, hopefully I'll be in Colorado in September, maybe. It would, it would be nice to actually see you again. Wonderful. All Good right. night, everybody. Bye. Bye.